My name is Simon Bronner. I'm with the House of Representatives Oral History Project. I'm here today with Kenneth B. Lee, who represented the 100th and 11th District for Sullivan, Susquehanna, and Wyoming counties and served as Speaker of the House, Minority Leader, and Majority Leader for the House of Representatives. I want to begin by asking you about your early life and how it came to be an influence on your public career. I was born, obviously. Uh, didn't come from uh, a particularly uh, political family. Uh, lived in Wellsboro my younger years and then moved to uh, Forksville because my father went broke in the Depression and uh, he went back in the lumber business. And so in Forksville I went to a one-room schoolhouse uh, and in high school I went to uh, Elkland Township Vocational High School which was obviously directed toward raising pigs, chickens, <laughs> whatever. And uh, a little weak on uh, math and the sciences and so on. Well, what made you decide to go to law school? Uh, I had been in service and uh, there was the GI Bill of Rights and uh, somebody else was going to pay for my education. I already had two years in college, so I went back, finished the two years, and then went on to law school. By the time I got ready to go to law school, I had two children and uh, a wife, and uh, uh, the economics of ever going to school again uh, were such that I had to do it if Uncle Sam was going to help. And, but no, no particular uh, background for the law or any family who had ever been lawyers. Well, how did you come to be district attorney of Sullivan County? Uh, relates back to the fact that I had two children. I needed whatever money I could get to uh, uh, make enough to live on. And uh, I was in my own law firm with uh, no uh, people to generate any income for me except myself. And uh, the district attorney at that time was uh, uh, a very elderly gentleman who was about my age today. And so uh, they felt they needed somebody a little younger. And so it was uh, not a difficult uh, decision and not a difficult election. Well, how about the transition then to run t for the House? Uh, which occurred uh, fairly quickly after, yeah, after you became years, district attorney. Yeah, two years. In fact, uh, uh, I was so grateful for them electing me uh, district attorney that I agreed I would serve for the remainder of my term without pay after I got in the legislature, which I did. And uh, if you know Sullivan County, 6,300 people, and uh, we never had much crime. So it uh, was not something that was very onerous. But uh, uh, Sullivan County is uh, a very close county politically. And uh, the uh, incumbent at that time was a Democrat who had uh, beaten uh, what everybody, or the fellow who everybody considered was the strongest candidate in the county. And so uh, he has been in office two years and there wasn't a great stampede to run against him. And so uh, I was young enough to think I could do it. And uh, uh, besides that, uh, in a rural county, uh, the uh, legislator is one of the uh, uh, most prestigious offices in the county. And uh, so I ran. What do you remember about the campaign? Uh, tough campaign, as all the campaigns were in Sullivan County. Uh, our registration was uh, uh, very close, and so uh, both uh, county offices and the legislature uh, would change back and forth. And uh, so it was a, just a personal campaign. Uh, whoever could get out and uh, see the most people and make the best impression uh, had the best chance of winning. And uh, uh, I, I guess I fooled them enough to, <laughs> to win it. What was the background of you joining the Republican Party? Uh, my father was a Republican, but not uh, uh, 
active, and the only time I think I ever heard him discussing politics was with my uh, one-room school teacher when she used to come and uh, have uh, dinner with us at night. She had to circulate around for meals, uh, arguing about uh, FDR. She loved him, and he did not. <laughs> it, uh, it wasn't too hot, but it was hot enough that my mother stopped inviting her back <laughs> to avoid the argument. And, uh, but uh, the other part of it was is that uh, just about uh, our entire area, other than Sullivan County, are very strong Republican. And then several of my friends uh, uh, eventually came to the legislature. Uh, uh, Warren Spencer and from Tioga County, which is a strong Republican. So I just gravitated there. Not, uh, in fact, in uh, the rural areas of Pennsylvania, philosophically, there is just so little difference between the parties that it's, uh, it's more a case of uh, doing what your parents did. What was your response to coming to the House for the first time? Well, I think that uh, everyone who comes to anything like this uh, has no conception of what it is or, uh, or how it operates. But uh, uh, the uh, governor at that time was leader. Uh, and uh, I guess the best thing I liked about it, it was one of the few places that I'd ever found after being in the service where you had such a community of interest with other people so that uh, uh, wherever you contacted them, you had something of interest to talk about. And uh, so I guess maybe uh, the sociable part about it was uh, the thing that uh, impressed me the most to start with. Did you have mentors in the house when you came in? No. Uh, I don't know that, uh, I, I guess the one mentor that I would have had was a fellow named Adam Bauer. Adam was from Northumberland County, and uh, uh, he was part of the old guard, the ones who had, from the back seats, had sort of run the house for years. And uh, I think if anyone gave me a feel for the politics of the house, it was probably him. And uh, the other one that would have had a great deal of influence on me would have been uh, uh, somebody that was junior to me in the house, uh, Al Bush from Lycoming County. He had uh, one of the best political minds in the uh, house. And then uh, I got to know Craig Truex, who eventually became uh, state chairman. He had been from Tioga County. And so, uh, and he had a, uh, a real mind for the uh, political system, and uh, I uh, probably learned a lot from him. Well, coming into the House from the 111th District, what were your concerns of representation? Uh, my area then, and probably it's still the same way, uh, would say to me, uh, look, leave us alone except in a couple of areas, and the rest of the time uh, we could live without you. But they, they needed, still need uh, money for schools, money for highways. Uh, and uh, beyond that, uh, they would like to be left alone. At the time you started, you were just representing Sullivan County, and then the district expanded. Did that provide a challenge to you? Not after I was elected. Uh, the challenge I had was that uh, my county had about 1,800 Republicans. Uh, uh, Wyoming County probably had about 14,000 Republicans. And uh, Susquehanna County would have been 24, 25,000. And uh, if I had had to run against any incumbent there, I, I couldn't have been elected. And so I probably am the most lucky guy that was ever uh, elected to a position in the House because the uh, fellow who was there from Susquehanna County, which would be really the toughest, uh, he and his county chairman didn't get along too well. And uh, 
she was willing to go to him and uh, tell him that uh, she wasn't going to support him, she was going to support me, and that uh, he would have a much better chance if he ran for the Senate. And she convinced him to run for the Senate, and I didn't have him. And a good friend of mine from Wyoming County, uh, who I had been in the house with for several years, had died recently before that. His wife then was uh, elected, and uh, she became uh, romantically inclined at this time, got married, and didn't want the job. So I wound up with a county chairman telling the one legislator to get out, and the other one uh, is leaving uh, for a honeymoon. So <laughs> I had a honeymoon. And uh, once I got in uh, to leadership, I was in leadership then. And uh, once I had it, then I, I had no problems after that. Well, I should ask you then, what was the background of you entering into leadership? Your first position was as majority leader. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, the only reason I would have been majority leader or anything was uh, because of a legislator from Allegheny County named Chick Agnew. The uh, legislature, uh, probably on both sides of the Senate and the House, and on both sides of the aisle, uh, the legislative leadership was pretty much determined by uh, people outside the legislature. And uh, it had been that way for years. And uh, I think Chick Agnew was sort of an independent from Allegheny County, knew that he was never going to get the nod from his uh, Republican Party in uh, Allegheny County. And he wanted to uh, uh, take over as majority leader. And so they had a knockdown, drag out fight over whether or not we continue uh, with an open uh, election where everybody knows who is voting for whom, and, uh, or a uh, secret ballot. And uh, Chick won that one, and I and quite a few other people helped him, but he principally was the one who pushed for it. And, and then he was the dot, he, he licked the, the uh, incumbent uh, majority leader and uh, took over as majority leader, and I think he probably uh, was majority leader for about two months, and he was in his 40s and died. And so they didn't have another Donnybrook at that time, but the uh, incumbent who had been defeated uh, uh, decided he was going to go to Congress. He was thought he'd probably be loved more down there than he was in Harrisburg. And so we really had a Donnybrook. I think uh, probably, I, I'm not sure exactly how many candidates, but maybe uh, six or seven candidates and uh, it went to five ballots. And uh, it kept getting down uh, to uh, myself and uh, George Hefner from uh, Schuylkill County. And George was uh, the uh, selection of the old political uh, bosses in the state. And uh, uh, one of the uh, governor's staff at that time was from Schuylkill County, and so he helped him. And so we went down to the fifth ballot, and. Uh, I finally, uh, finally won it. And I think the reason I won it uh, was not because of anything I had shown in the House, but the members were just so sick of having their decisions predetermined by the selection of leadership that they really wanted to change. And uh, I obviously had uh, no uh, power of any kind throughout the state from uh, a little county like Sullivan. And uh, so they wanted uh, somebody that they thought uh, would represent them and, uh, and not uh, the uh, other constituents there on the state. And so uh, they elected me. Describe the job of majority and then minority leader at that time. Uh, probably still the same way, although maybe not. Uh, but we, uh, all the time that I was in the House, we probably had uh, no more than a three or four uh, vote majority on either side, Democratic or Republican. And uh, in situations like that, everything is political. And uh, uh, so we, it was a, uh, it was a Donnybrook. It, uh, it was probably the most stressful uh, job I think I've ever had in my life. I mean, uh, you lived with it all the time. I mean, you didn't. Uh, leave Harrisburg and forget about it. You tried to figure out what the issues were going to be next week, and you 
tried to come up with what you thought would make some uh, valid response to whatever was going to be brought up on the other side? Well, one of the pivotal moments historically at that time was the creation of a full-time legislature. And you were an advocate for that. Could you describe the background of going from a part-time to a full-time legislature? Uh, when we first went to uh, Harrisburg, if my memory is correct, uh, we uh, just had uh, uh, biennial uh, sessions. And uh, shortly after I was there, or maybe just before I came, they came up with uh, a fiscal session one year and a general session the next. And uh, I don't think that made any sense to anybody. So uh, uh, I think there was a consensus that uh, we ought to go to uh, a full-time uh, session every year. Reflecting back, was there a difference between the part-time legislature and what it tended to enact and the full-time legislature? Uh, Mostly the full-time legislature uh, came after I did, but uh, uh, was gone. But in talking to uh, the uh, people who were, who were still there, both mostly the members, but also some of the leaders, and uh, they were of the opinion that uh, much more difficult to get the fellows who were there from uh, the late 70s until now to make a uh, difficult vote. They, uh, uh, so many of them, a majority of them, uh, uh, are totally reliant on uh, the economics of being elected the next time. And uh, so uh, either they get elected or they don't have a job. But most of the people in uh, uh, most of my time in office uh, outside of the leadership had uh, uh, pretty much a full-time job back home. and you. We're down here a couple, three days a week, and uh, uh, then work the job back home. You mentioned coming in under Governor Leader as majority leader. You had a relationship with Governor Scranton. Could you describe that? Uh, yeah. Uh, it spoiled me. Uh, I, for the first time, had had the opportunity to work with the uh, front office. And uh, they really uh, were more interested in accomplishing something other than their own little personal agenda. And uh, I, uh, that's very easy to work with people like that because you're pretty much all going in the same direction. And, uh, but when you get a governor, which I have found most of them are, have an agenda which is totally alien to uh, whatever is going on around or the needs of the state, uh, uh, you find that uh, there is a great deal of room for conflict. And, and I had uh, a great deal of room for conflict for both uh, my, uh, the successors of uh, Scranton uh, while I was in office. The other one, though, I would like to mention because uh, it is so funny, you know, when you become a politician, everybody assumes you're going to be a politician all of your life. And uh, I wasn't in the leadership at the time that Lawrence was there. But uh, I would have liked to see, uh, have seen Lawrence have another four years to try and accomplish what he did in uh, uh, the Pittsburgh area for the rest of the state. And uh, he would have probably uh, been able to do it more than uh, Scranton or any of the rest of them because he uh, had a handle on the unions, and nobody else did. And uh, uh, to do anything industrially, you've got to have uh, both the unions and, uh, and industry with you to make any great movement. And uh, I just think uh, industrially uh, uh, it would have been great. I have a, it may take a little too much time, but. Uh, Please. Uh, I got to know uh, Lawrence's secretary of commerce. Uh, I think maybe his name might have been Brennan. But uh, I had a small silk mill in uh, one of my towns in uh, Sullivan County that had lost its uh, 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 
employers, and uh, I was trying to get somebody to replace them, and so I was going through the industrial development uh, operation in the Department of Commerce. And uh, so I used to stop over in the department uh, once every two or th three weeks to see if they were still doing anything on it. But in the meantime, I had had several beers downtown with the Secretary of Commerce. And so I got in the habit of sticking my head in his uh, uh, office and jabbing him when I'd go by. And this particular time, I went, sucked my head in the office and he said, come on in. He said, I got to have somebody's shoulder to cry on. He said, I think I lost probably the best employer that we've had the opportunity of getting in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And uh, he wouldn't tell me who it was. They had set up a separate corporation just to look. But he told me what their needs were and wherever they had been. And uh, the closest to my area was over in Falls. But uh, I thought that he was describing this place that I used to have to go to over in Wyoming County to my in-laws place and so I told him about it and so while I sit there he got the uh, Department of Forest and Waters and, the, and uh, everybody else he thought uh, uh, would have a decision in making it and to see if it was the right kind of uh, territory. It turns out it was Procter & Gamble mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, after about two hours or three hours of sitting listening to him I got up and left and about two years later, Procter & Gamble came into uh, Tunkhannock in Wyoming County, which eventually became my uh, district. But uh, uh, maybe that's the reason I uh, have such a good feeling about Lawrence. He was sort of instrumental. And he was instrumental also in uh, uh, putting Route 80 across the, the, the state. All of the Philadelphia politicians, and Dilworth especially, was totally opposed to it. But uh, he made a deal with uh, uh, our senator at that time. Uh, uh, his name will come back to me before I finish. And uh, he had gotten into the Senate just for the purpose of trying to get uh, a interstate across the northern part of Pennsylvania, Confair, Dick Confair. And uh, so uh, the governor needs uh, a gasoline tax. And he couldn't budge the Senate, which was in the Republican hands, for one vote for the gas tax. But he had Confair over, talked about it, and Confair finally broke uh, ranks with the Republicans and gave Lawrence enough votes to get the gas tax. And we got Route 80. And uh, uh, I shouldn't say this, I guess, but Confair was ostracized by his peers <laughs> in the Senate until the day he left the Senate. But uh, he, uh, it was the single most important vote, uh, and Lawrence helped us out, yeah. Was a lot of business conducted in the restaurants and bars around the Capitol during those days? I would say all of the good business, yeah. <laughs> now, it, uh, I, I think the most important part about what went on was uh, uh, building up knowledge of, of who you're dealing with and, uh, and uh, discussing what your problems are, who you're mad at. You worked very closely in leadership with Bob Butera, among others. Uh, what was your relationships and how did you work together? Fine. I never, uh, uh, I probably had uh, two people in the house on either side that uh, I couldn't work with, and uh, obviously it was uh, very easy to work with uh, the Bob Buteras. Bob uh, is uh, one of the most decent people I've known. Are there others that you would describe that were part of the alliances or, or people who you worked closely with during your time? Uh, not with delegations, with uh, certain people that uh, you knew in the delegations, and uh, uh, and I guess because I was in rural Pennsylvania, I uh, probably gravitated to uh, uh, them more than anybody else. But uh, uh, I, I don't know of a delegation uh, that I oh I I can think of two or three legislators at certain periods uh, didn't speak to me for a year or two, but uh, eventually. Uh, 
when I left, uh, maybe they were all glad to see me go, but by the time I left, uh, I think uh, uh, we got along fine. The names Jack Seltzer, Evan Williams also come up in relationship to that time and, and working with you. What do you recall of them? Uh, even uh, was from Bradford County, which was right next door to me. Uh, uh, and Spencer was in Tioga County, and uh, uh, they were, were and have been until both of them have died now, but until they died, they were still two of the best friends I ever had. And uh, we did everything that we did in life with them uh, as families. And as leader, you were referring to the major urban delegations, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, and you said something about coming from a rural county and well, having to negotiate. Could you no, talk about those delegations? No real problem. Uh, the uh, <coughs> Generally, the, the bedroom counties around Philadelphia were uh, probably uh, the most responsive group of people that you had to deal with. You, you had some individuals in each delegation that uh, you had to sort of let the rest of the delegation take care of for you. But uh, most of them uh, were very well balanced and their, their instincts were good. And uh, Mo Montgomery County probably was the best. Uh, you could assume that uh, if Montgomery County sent somebody up to uh, Harrisburg, uh, they would be the kind of people that ought to be in Harrisburg. Very often in Pennsylvania politics, there's a distinction made between rural and urban politics. Are you, you saying that, that that was not your experience? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, if somebody said to me, uh, what were the two things that uh, you think ought to be done to uh, uh, improve the, the legislature? and uh, as I mentioned to you earlier in the day, my first uh, priority was that every legislator ought to have experienced a long, deep recession. It changes their whole attitudes, and it would be a good uh, attitude change for most of them. And I guess the next one I would say has nothing to do with urban areas. There are several urban areas that would be included, but there are other areas of the state also that I would say never elect leaders, them to leadership positions. They, uh, uh, they just live in a system that uh, uh, if they aren't, don't have problems themselves, then uh, they are uh, so used to living in that kind of an atmosphere that they bring it to Harrisburg. And uh, when uh, they bring it to Harrisburg or are in the leadership position, it uh, really frustrates the rest of the, uh, the House, but uh, uh, without any ability really to do anything about it. How would living through a recession, as you mentioned, change your outlook? Uh, well, it gives you a much different perception of the value of the dollar and what you do with it. That uh, uh, before you spend money, uh, you would examine what you're spending it on and make sure you have the vehicle by which it will work before you start throwing money at it. And uh, the, uh, most of them would start out by throwing the money because that's the easiest. And uh, eventually the, the, the budgets just go crazy. During the early years of your tenure, historians have described that period as a time of a reform movement in Pennsylvania talking about a change of the guard from the old guard to the young Turks. And I imagine you would be categorized as one of the young Turks. What, what do you recall on this reform period and this confrontation? Well, the, the whole thing uh, uh, had its inception in Chick Agnew getting the uh, leadership in the House, uh, in the, on the Republican side of the House. Uh, on a secret ballot. Uh, eventually, the Democrats did it. And uh, I think, to some degree, the Senate has. And it, it just produces uh, uh, a lot of things that uh, uh, the uh, so-called uh, vested interests are 
not particularly interested in. Well, one of the issues that came up at, at that time was the relationship of the legislature to the executive branch. And what is your recollection of either those negotiations about the legislature becoming more empowered or working with uh, the governor? I, uh, I don't think that's institutional. I think that uh, is, uh, the tone of that is set by mostly the governor. And, uh, uh, you know, everybody uh, uh, understands when uh, uh, they're being given lip service and when you're actually uh, in a position where you can have some input. And uh, uh, the smart governors, let's see, yeah, I can think of two. Uh, you got to name them. <laughs> <laughs> no, the smart governors uh, uh, know what they want to do, and then they contact enough people around the state and in the legislature to see if there's some parameters that they don't dare to go outside of to, uh, to attack the problem, and, uh, and or what changes should be made that will make it easier to get through the legislature. And uh, so that when it comes to the legislature, 75% uh, of your work is done. Uh, I won't give you an illustration, I won't name them by name, but for instance, uh, uh, one of uh, the governors and wanted to adopt an income tax. And the principal reason, among other things, was because his predecessor had thought of the idea of uh, uh, trying to get an income tax passed, decided he couldn't do it. So uh, we now are just about to go into a uh, legislative campaign, and he is all over the state promoting his income tax. And so every meeting that our poor legislative candidates go to with their people, they have to commit that they will not vote for the income tax. And so by the time we are there in session uh, with the bodies in Harrisburg to enact an income tax, he had preempted any possibility. And, uh, and we, uh, we just went around circles for about two or three months uh, until he finally agreed that there was absolutely no votes for the income tax. And he had taken any possibility away from us and didn't realize it. And uh, that's why I say there are so many people in politics who have no conception of the, of the, of the system. And he, he never did. Well, what is the system? How would you char characterize it? Probably the best system in the world. Uh, and in uh, certain times, uh, it, is, uh, it lives up to its uh, reputation. And that is when uh, you're in uh, a crisis of some kind. And everybody agrees it's a crisis, and they're all going the uh, same direction in the, the uh, amount of energy and the amount of uh, intelligence that uh, goes into the solution of the problem is, uh, is boundless. But most of the time, uh, it is in things that people don't think are a real crisis. And in those cases, it is just terrible to. And, and some of, you know, medical problem today, uh, is, uh, if they were if they gave it the same consideration that uh, they give for World War II or some other problem like that, they could solve it in uh, five or six months. But uh, uh, I don't think until it's really gone down the tube that uh, they will ever generate that kind of energy in the same direction. Well, you served from 1957 to 1974. Were there crises during that time that you recall that brought people together and resulted in real change in action? Uh, oh, I don't think there was any crisis that uh, there would be a consensus that it was a crisis. I think the uh, toughest vote we ever had in the House was uh, uh, just about the first month or two that I was uh, majority leader. Uh, Scranton decided that the uh, unemployment compensation law had to be passed. And uh, it became a, an absolute Donnybrook where uh, uh, members' houses were being shot at and uh, uh, they're carrying caskets through the hallways of the house. 
and uh, we had a uh, Democratic member of the House down in a hotel in Harrisburg uh, because he had a bad heart and uh, knew that if he stayed up on the floor of the House, it was going to be such a turmoil that I'd have to have a heart attack. And so we had to get somebody to bring him up for the last vote. At, I don't know what time of the night it was, but, but it was it was a good place to start because after that it was downhill as far as, uh, but, uh, and I don't think the, the bill lasted uh, or has affected uh, anybody in any drastic way at all, but it was a case of uh, not getting your foot in the door. And, uh, what about Hurricane Agnes here on the Hill? What are your recollections of uh, that emergency? Well. That is an emergency that the legislature can't do much of anything about. Whatever uh, uh, is going to have to be done, the executive has to do it. And if they need money for the uh, uh, whatever has been involved or the cleanup and so on, they would have to come uh, to the legislature. But we would be a reactive uh, uh, body in that. We wouldn't be active at all. You were on the Hill at the time, though, weren't you? What do you recall? Uh, I guess my biggest recollection is how stupid the people were that owned the ready mix operation down the lower part of the city because I could watch the waters coming up until it's about seven or eight feet up uh, vehicles that probably cost uh, forty-five and fifty thousand dollars a piece mm. that nobody bothered moving. Mm. Uh, and other than that, uh, uh, how to get home, and uh, then. Just uh, uh, watching as everybody else did. Uh, How did you get out? Uh, just had to go up uh, a couple of back ways into the hills to stay away from the river. Before we talked about the Old Garden New Turks, I should be sure to ask you, who did you consider the Turks? Who did you consider the Old Guard? Uh, most everybody in the house were Turks, uh, regardless of their age, because I don't think uh, any of them were particularly happy about uh, the kind of influence that outside interests had in the thing. So uh, they uh, wouldn't be out front pushing for the change, but they were quietly uh, hoping that Agnew and the, the rest of the, of the fellows who started that movement were successful. Was it generational? Did it have something to do with the military experience and depression background? Of a no, lot no, of I, no, no, no. I don't think so. I, I think it was uh, uh, just a natural progression everywhere that uh, uh, the people who had uh, control things uh, had lost touch, and uh, so it was a case of uh, uh, somebody c uh, coming in to put the. Uh, rest of the people who wanted to change uh, together and getting them in a position where they uh, had enough courage to openly uh, uh, support the change. And uh, so there wouldn't be any retribution in the House from the old guard and uh, the young Turks because I would guess with very few exceptions, the old guard liked it too. You also mentioned people who you couldn't get along with. Who were they, and why do you think uh, you couldn't? Uh, there were only two. I think Herb Feynman and Josh Alberg uh, from Philadelphia. Those were the. Uh, and why do you think those conflicts occurred? Uh, I would guess uh, their constituency was so different from not only mine, but the rest of the state. And uh, uh, you. Uh, you couldn't negotiate with them. They, uh, they had their agenda, and they were not about to change. Uh, Roy Irvis, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Roy Irvis got, I think, his uh, uh, promotion in the House and probably uh, 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 up into a position of leadership because he sort of became the great mediator <laughs> between uh, Herb Feynman and I. We just couldn't talk to each other. and uh, and so. Roy would come and talk to me and go and talk to Herb. And, and, uh, what was your recollection of Irvis? 
oh, uh, a real statesman uh, uh, and a nice guy. He, uh, uh, Roy's, uh, Roy's instincts were good, and uh, uh, you couldn't, uh, if you couldn't get along with Roy, why, you probably wouldn't get along with anybody. So he was on the other side of the aisle yeah, with yeah, the other would, party, but you was, had a good. Yeah, he relation. would have been the whip at the time. Uh, I am having most of my problems with Feynman. So he was, he was part of the Democratic leadership, but uh, uh, whatever communications were going on, uh, uh, Roy and I, I did it. Okay. Well, after you were minority leader in 1968, then the following year you didn't have a leadership position and then returned as a minority leader the following year. Is that correct? Uh, I guess I would have been out for maybe two years, and then I was elected speaker again. Uh, what what happened in that time, if you could describe, in terms of the leadership? Uh, well, we obviously lost the House, and uh, uh, I lost my speaker's job. And uh, Lee Donaldson had uh, been majority leader. And so it would have been a, a case of me trying to knock uh, Lee out as minority leader. And uh, uh, I just didn't feel it was fair, because the, actually the minority leader's job is uh, so much more difficult than the speaker's job. And uh, so if you've had the job for two years, uh, you don't even if somebody can bump you, you shouldn't be bumped. And, uh, and I'm not sure uh, I could have bumped him. And if I had uh, tried to bump him and had been unsuccessful, I wouldn't have been speaker again in two years. Well, let me ask you how you came to run for speaker. Uh, I really didn't have uh, a speaker was no problem. I, I was majority leader, and uh, when the speaker's job came up, it was a natural place to go. The uh, uh, why I got to be majority leader is the uh, uh, the probably the real stretch. Uh, we had uh, probably eight or ten counties in the north central part of Pennsylvania. Uh, Adam Bauer was uh, uh, a representative from Northumberland County. Adam was one of the so-called old guard who pulled all the strings from uh, behind uh, the doors and, and helped pretty much run the house. And uh, he was in this group, which was sort of unlikely. And so we decided to get together because we were having problems with the big delegations and we as individual uh, counties uh, really had not much clout. And so we decided we would go together and create a, a little clout in the north central part of the state. And so now the majority leader's job has come up. And uh, Philadelphia has one, Allegheny County has one. There are probably five or six other guys uh, from around Schuylkill County had one uh, that are going to run for the majority leader's job. And so. Uh, we had just gotten into the mix and decided that we ought to have a candidate also. And uh, so I was selected as the Northern Tiers uh, uh, candidate. And I think much to their surprise, I, uh, uh, I won the thing. And, uh, and from then on, of course, it was sort of uh, downhill I, once you got established. Well, how do you describe the job of being speaker? Speaker is uh, actually very easy. Uh, I had uh, a fellow named Eddie Moore, who uh, was generally considered to be the second best parliamentarian in the United States. And so you just go in the office and tell Eddie to keep you out of trouble. <laughs> and everything. Now, Eddie did not have much of a flair for politics or the intricacies of politics, but uh, for what happened on the floor, it was his lifeblood. I mean, you just did not do anything 
that would lower the dignity of the House if you wanted Eddie to stay as your parliamentarian. Did you miss giving up the power of majority leader as speaker? Oh, no. It uh, was probably the most stressful. I, I didn't have to take uh, much of any work home as speaker, but uh, as majority or minority leader, I took all the work home and, and worked the full rest of the week uh, getting prepared for the next week. How did you compare yourself as speaker to others? Oh, as long as they had 80 more, they were very good. <laughs> okay. Well, in 1974, you uh, decided to run for statewide office. Can you describe how that occurred? Uh, I was going to quit the House anyway. And uh, uh, for all practical purposes, that was going to be my last uh, time in office of any kind. And then uh, it appeared that Drew Lewis was going to get the nomination. And uh, I just decided I would love to uh, uh, be in the executive branch with somebody like Drew Lewis as, uh, as governor. And so uh, I made the run. And uh, that was the only time in uh, my career, uh, probably not, but the only time I can recall, that uh, my timing was terrible. If you remember, we ran right at the height of uh, Watergate <laughs> when nobody was voting Republican. And, uh, and so we, other, other than that, I think we probably would have been fine. But uh, nobody was voting for Republicans in 74. Do you enjoy campaigning? Yeah, yeah, in certain areas. Uh, uh, in uh, most areas of Pennsylvania, it is, it is fun to campaign in. Other areas, uh, uh, it, well, it's like dealing with people. I mean, uh, some areas, they just make you feel at home. And, uh, and uh, so uh, you feel uh, you're getting through to them and you're accomplishing something. Other areas, uh, for whatever reason, uh, are very cool. How did campaigning change from the early part of your legislative career to the later part? Well, the, uh, in my own district, which uh, uh, obviously I guess you want to know about, uh, Sullivan County uh, was 6,300 people. Uh, I uh, was a practicing attorney and uh, had been district attorney and had known uh, and had lived there for 10 years. And so I knew most of the people or knew somebody who knew somebody else. And so I literally uh, would uh, go door to door and I would uh, uh, get up at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning and hit uh, five or six farms while they were still doing their morning milking. And uh, that impresses farmers and they talk to other farmers. And uh, the other thing, I, uh, we have the largest town in the community. Uh, at the time when I first came there, I think, had about uh, six or seven hundred people in it and ten bars. And uh, it was on about half the county was much similar. And so uh, you, you campaign in the bars. I mean, you, uh, you hit more people in the bars at that time. Now nobody goes to bars, but you, if you want to hit a lot of people. And they would be normally people that uh, you'd have getting anywhere else. And uh, one of the things I discovered that didn't cost that much money because then you get the bar owner talking in your favor is that you go to each one of the bars, hit it at a time when you know there aren't too many people there, and buy a drink for all the bar. And it may be six or eight people, but <laughs> you don't get any of their votes maybe, but uh, you do make a, a happy bar owner. That, uh, <laughs> But a very personal, very personal. When I went over to the other uh, counties, obviously, uh, it was uh, you're then into a district that uh, you just normally hit the picnics and uh, uh, their meetings and uh, uh, join the local grains and this kind of thing. Did your use of media change from the 1950s to the 1970s? Not in my area because we didn't have uh, uh, that much media. You have television now that covers pretty much everything. But that gets uh, so expensive that running for 
the legislature, you can't afford to buy much media time. What role did your family have in your campaigns or in your legislative career? My uh, wife had a lot. She uh, uh, is really a people person, and uh, she just uh, uh, dotes on uh, getting out and talking and, and circulating. So uh, she was a great asset. <coughs> uh, the rest of the f family were mixed. I, my youngest son, from the time that he was uh, able to get any inclination of what was going on, politics was his, was his life from you know five or six years. I had another son who, when I was running for lieutenant governor, was going to school for the first time. So he wanted to get so far away from it <laughs> that he went outside the state <laughs> and enrolled and came back after I lost. So uh, and the rest of them are very helpful, but but not. In fact, uh, I should say now that uh, we were deficient in a little because I have two of the most liberal daughters who are Democrats who both work for uh, the bureaucracy in Washington. <laughs> and the boys are just the opposite. The press often referred to you as a moderate Republican. Reflecting back, what does that mean or how did you respond to that characterization? I would think that uh, the reason they labeled me as that is because they got to know me. Uh, if uh, I would have been painted as a stereotype by the leadership on the other side, I was a back mountain conservative who had absolutely no idea where Philadelphia was or what their needs were. But uh, one of the smartest things I did, I belonged to a hunting camp up near where I live. And uh, uh, once a year, I would invite all of the uh, uh, reporters up. And uh, we just had a, uh, a picnic for two or three days. And uh, the uh, reporters are somewhat similar to politicians. that They love it wherever there's something free to drink and so on. And so I, uh, and you know, you have enough contact with them. They don't take you out of context. They take you uh, with whatever context they've had with you, and I found it very helpful. It, uh, I kept out of uh, uh, that position where they have a tendency to, to put you in a category and you never get out of it. And, uh, How do you describe your politics yourself? Uh, I would say right now, uh, I am way over on the cynical side. Uh, I just think uh, we could do so much better. Uh, and uh, uh, my son, who was a total idealist, uh, idealist and uh, uh, was very uh, conservative fiscally, thought that uh, he could change the system. And he decided after six years, <laughs> he wasn't making a dent out of it, so he got out. And, uh, I decided I wasn't going to change it either. I uh, had been in long enough that uh, uh, it have some impact on it, but it's sort of a personal limited impact that uh, as soon as uh, you're gone, it goes. Well, when did that occur, and how did it occur? Uh, I think I mentioned maybe that uh, uh, Scranton spoiled me. And uh, I knew what could be done with a governor such as Scranton and with the kind of people that Scranton had on his staff uh, that you sort of expected more of the governors that came afterward and their staffs. And when you found out that uh, what you thought was important, uh, they did not think important at all. Uh, that they and the governor usually have uh, their own rather narrow agenda and if it uh, uh, leaks out that they can do something constructive, uh, it will happen. Otherwise, it's not at the top of their, their agenda. Well, did you consider, after the 74 lieutenant governor run, of making another run for statewide office? No, 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 no. I, uh, 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 I guess I recognize my limitations. Uh, I, would, uh, I would love to be behind the scenes uh, with a good guy as governor, 
but uh, I would, uh, I think, probably fail miserably if I were out front uh, trying to carry the thing. I don't think I, I don't think my uh, talents are that much. Did you encourage your son to run? Oh, sure. That's all he ever wanted. I mean, he, he really just couldn't wait uh, till he could uh, get out and get started. And uh, he had a very difficult start because uh, uh, the legislator who was in at that time uh, had wanted him to run, too, and had encouraged him. And uh, she said, now, let me know what your timetable is and when you think you're ready, and uh, I will get out of office. And uh, uh, this is probably not why she changed her mind, but she was a woman, and she changed her mind and decided that uh, she not only wasn't going to support him, but she was going to uh, get out of office before he, he had just gotten out of uh, uh, law school. The first thing he did after he got out of law school was started running for uh, uh, the legislature. And uh, he came from the same county I did. He had to run in uh, the uh, other two counties in a primary. Both of those counties uh, didn't have incumbents, but they had uh, 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 the uh, party-backed candidates in each one of their counties. And uh, he carried our own county. He carried uh, Wyoming County and came in second in the other county, which was almost by a landslide. But he, he worked, and, uh, and, uh, and I think if he had any success down here, uh, he would still be down here. But he got, uh, he got tired of it. You had mentioned that one of the contributions you made was to work with a legislative campaign uh, committee. Could you describe that and your reasons for promoting that? Well, everybody, uh, both sides, have legislative campaigns. Uh, the, uh, I use the legislative campaigns as uh, a method of sort of unifying our caucus. Most of the uh, other people who uh, are involved in this uh, want to make sure that they are the ones that get credit for electing the guys so they have some personal loyalty. And uh, I thought I needed more than personal loyalty to hold them together. So uh, I uh, set it up so that uh, uh, state committee was always involved and uh, that their local county chairman were always involved. And about the only way you could get them involved is on distribution of money. So we'd collect uh, the money through our legislative uh, campaign, uh, send it down to state committee, and their treasure down there then was uh, the one who actually wrote the checks that we designated. They signed the check, and our treasurer signed the check. And then before, and th so they knew the, that it was coming from state committee, which made them uh, grateful to state committee, and state committee would have some impact when we needed some help on them. We could go to state committee and uh, already have a few brownie points built up. But we'd also build up some points with their uh, county chairman by notifying him about two weeks before the guy is going to get the money. And the county chairman then would go and tell him that this amount of money is coming from state committee. He was just talking to the state chairman and so on and so on and, and so on. And so we got the county chairman, the state committee, uh, all involved in, in that legislator's uh, elections. Because there were many times when we had to go back and ask him for a tough vote that maybe on our own we couldn't have gotten it. But when state committee and this county chairman are going in the same direction, uh, uh, we got it from him. What was your strength as a legislator? Uh, w with regard to legislation, I would say uh, no strength. I uh, came from an area that uh, didn't need much of anything. Uh, they needed uh, education money. They needed highway money. But in the way of the rest of the legislation that we could pass, they would probably like to have, them, or la have us forget them. <laughs> so legislatively, I, I was not my strong suit. but. Uh, I, uh, I knew the legislators, both in the uh, House and the Senate. I mean, I, 
got so that I, on the Republican side, and, and quite a few of the Democrats too, but, but I got so I knew them very personally, not uh, uh, just to talk to them, but uh, I knew whether they were farmers, whether they were mechanics, uh, if they had a farm, whether they uh, uh, raised beef cattle or, or whatever with their fishing. And uh, so I, I had a, uh, I think probably a better working rapport with the legislature than anybody uh, that's ever been in a position of leadership. How do you view the difference between the House and the Senate? Uh, I think probably the same uh, uh, difference as there is in Washington, uh, uh, probably to a lesser degree, but uh, uh, a lot of my good friends from the House uh, went from the House to the Senate, and uh, with several exceptions, it uh, was different. But they get anointed, uh, and uh, they uh, feel that they are just a cut above anybody else in the process. And uh, it would be fine if they were, or if they believed it and didn't let everybody else think it, why it wouldn't be that a problem. But uh, with exceptions, there are some uh, great uh, senators that I've known over there, some of the best people we've had. And, uh, but most of them get to be a little pompous. What are your fondest memories of serving in the House? Oh, I think uh, the friendships I developed. Uh, uh, we are in Florida for about uh, six months a year now. And uh, when we first went down, we probably had about 12 couples who were right in the round us that sort of came because we were there. And uh, three quarters of them were old legislators. Who uh, and uh, we're still uh, still friends with them. Are you still political? Uh, oh, I talk about it and think about it a lot. But <laughs> uh, as far as uh, 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 being active or uh, uh, contributing anything much to it, not. What do you consider your greatest accomplishments? Well, if you'd name it <laughs> something that was accomplished, maybe I can. But uh, uh, if you, just on a personal basis, uh, but uh, then after you leave, you're, you're not sure that uh, you really accomplished much of anything. But uh, I think uh, I probably uh, straightened the house out is not correct, but. Uh, I think uh, uh, the House was much more responsive uh, uh, to its constituency and to the uh, uh, members and uh, uh, the rest of the state uh, uh, when I left before I came. Do you have disappointments? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I, uh, uh, when Tom Brokaw says we are the greatest generation, actually, uh, uh, we were the luckiest generation, and uh, uh, I was in politics and uh, have lived at a uh, time that uh, was so much easier than uh, uh, the people who are following us, and, uh, uh, and 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 we were tempered by uh, uh, things that made us react differently, but. Uh, the thing probably that is worse uh, in the system now than it used to be is there is a terrible tendency to try to set policy and run things by the fringes. In other words, it is much more newsworthy to have the radicals over here and the radicals over here. And the news media gets so involved with those two that it makes it almost impossible for the people in the, the middle who have to accomplish something to do it. And uh, if there was anything, I guess, that I would say I would change, and it's impossible to change, obviously. But uh, we went from a time when the uh, political leaders had a great deal of say in uh, the selection and the uh, uh, election of officials. Now uh, they have almost lost it, except in uh, a few areas. And the news media has taken over, which means that uh, 
Uh, you get some bad people uh, that the political leaders select, but at least there is a winnowing process that has some sense to it by people who know them. And the news media, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess, have a tendency to make political horrors more than statement or statesmen. They they just uh, they cater so much to the fringes that the fringes think they are the ones that really ought to set policy, and they ought to be the ones who are tempering the guys in the middle to keep them somewhere within limitations, but not be running the policy. And, and that, that I think, is a, the real weakness of our system now. Well, if you have advice for new legislators today, what would it be? Uh, I, I guess I would say uh, uh, there are going to be some tough decisions that you have to make and decisions that uh, are going to make it increasingly more difficult for you to get elected. And so don't get yourself involved in the job so much that uh, you can't make those decisions because you economically can't afford to do it, which would go back to uh, my old theory that uh, uh, probably a uh, civilian legislature was more responsive than uh, uh, a highly paid uh, elect, uh, uh, legislators that have so many perks to do so many things uh, for their constituents that uh, that's all they're interested in. They aren't interested in much of anything else. How do you want your legislative career to be remembered? Uh, probably that I wasn't the worst speaker. Well, with that, I want to thank Speaker Lee for sharing your memories with us in this project. Thank you very much.